we're going to go ahead and begin today's class. I'd like to welcome everybody here to our 2019 Apple Grafting Workshop, um, brought to you on behalf of Virginia Cooperative Extension, and welcome to our viewers at Citizens Telephone that will all be having that opportunity to see, uh, see your handiwork, uh, possibly in the, in the months to come, with regards to uh, grafting apples. That's what we're all here today to do. Um, it should be fun and enjoyable for all of us, uh, particularly those of us that enjoy horticulture and, ha and enjoy having that opportunity to be outside. And um, There's lots of reasons that we graft. In individuals have certain desires maybe for that heritage variety or that heirloom variety that they remember that Granny had on their, her property and uh, they want to perpetuate that particular tree. Maybe you found an old tree in a fence line that you'd like to uh, uh, make sure that you can reproduce it as well. Um, so that's the whole purpose, uh, one of the many purposes of grafting. And um, so today, each one of you will have an opportunity. I'm going to, if we are good at learning this little bit of art and technique, you will find that you can be very successful in uh, making lots of trees out of just a select few. And um, because all it takes is a single, a single sprout, a single scion, and if I may, can I borrow? Remember which side I got that out of? But every year, uh, if your trees have been um, surviving on the property, or if you've gone to borrow or collect some cyan out of someone else's tree, what we always tend to look for is something that is just about this size, maybe a little larger. I usually tell people pencil size. And um, this material we collect out of the tree in February during pruning time. Why do we collect in February? Um, largely because all my orchardists in the area and you as homeowners should be pruning in that February, late February, early March time frame the majority, majority of your fruit trees in Floyd County. Um, that's a period when it's cold enough, we still don't have insects working against us, uh, none of the disease organisms are out blowing around on the wind currents and ready, ready to settle on our new, uh, our new trees. and. Um, most importantly, the sap flow is down, and all those pruning cuts that we're making that time of year is really being done at the probably the healthiest point we can possibly do it. Um, before I get too far ahead of myself, I would like to say um, there's lots of reasons why uh, why we graft. Well, we want we have a, have a little over um, 10, maybe 12 varieties outside the door here that we're going to talk about different varieties that you'll be able to graft on top. There are some additional reasons why we put uh, the, our desired variety, the variety we've come to enjoy, whether it be taste-wise or our favorite variety that we cook with, um, whatever it may be, there's a reason why we take a vegetative cutting and put it on a rootstock. And that's largely because if we allow, um, if we were simply to plant the seed from an apple, we have no idea about what, that, what type of apple tree that seed is going to grow. Um, in fact, all through the process um, of flowering and being pollinated, uh, you're joining two parents together and you end up in a situation where the seed itself once planted, six years later and preparing to bear fruit, um, could have the best of both parents, it could have the worst of both parents, or it could have a parent that was actually from you know, two plus miles away um, uh, down in a neighbor's property that happened to be a crab apple and pollinated. So that's the interesting thing about apple species. The, um, uh, they're all uh, capable of being um, intermixed or interpollinated. And what you end up with is, like I said, a mixed bag if you ever plant the seed. If you expect to have that same variety of apple that you've come to enjoy, the only way to achieve that is through a vegetative cutting. Now, in the commercial industry, we try to do or use these rootstocks for additional reasons. What's the big reason why we oftentimes think about rootstock? Any, any ideas? Size of the tree. In fact, that's probably, in today's day and age, a number one reason for looking about putting our trees that we enjoy on top of a desired rootstock so that we can control the tree's overall mature size. 
It enables us, instead of having the apples that we climbed in as children that are 40 feet tall and required ladders to pick and 14 birdhouses and a tire swing, um, now this has enabled us to get apples much, you know, much closer to the ground. Um, advantages from a convention, uh, conventional production standpoint is we use less pesticides to actually spray those tree canopies. So instead of sitting back and air blasting up into the air to cover a 40 foot tall tree, now we can literally go down the rows and spray up to 1,200 trees per acre and actually use less product than when we used the 120 tree per acre rate back in the day. So it's, um, there are lots of advantages, not just size, but reduced pesticide usage. Um, I've provided paperwork on all your tables. I do want to mention that I've included an organic spray guide. Um, it's on the blue or combined in the, in the blue section of that paperwork. Um, we're going to put all our paper, paperwork away here in just a minute and pay attention to what we have to do. But this is the information that will allow you to go home and um, take care of your trees after the fact. Um, do want to mention that your rootstock also control not just tree size, but oftentimes um, where well, they were originally bred to control for insects, specifically woolly apple aphid, uh, an insect that was, was demolishing uh, apples on the European side of the world and um, really where the uh, interest in the initial rootstock development team um, was really looking to control uh, with a, an insect with a tree that offered some resistance to it. So in the process of developing rootstock over the years, we also found that some rootstock are disease free. And what we're looking at up here, this is a brand new rootstock that I've never tried before in Floyd County. Um, but one I think every one of us in this room should be very interested in trying. And the reason being, this is a Geneva 935, and it's, it's still not a dwarf dwarf rootstock. It's still going to be a tree that's going to want to get up uh, 12, 15 feet in height, maybe as high as 18 feet at maturity. But the neat thing about this tree is it not only has an insect package as far as resistant to woolly apple aphid, but it's also got its disease package, meaning that number one, it's resistant to fire blight. One of the most damaging apple diseases we have in Floyd County and neighboring southwest Virginia. Uh, that's a bacterial disease that when it gets into our trees, it can actually translocate down and kill a young tree in a single year's time. It can cause damage and dieback in large trees. So this particular rootstock is uh, fire blight resistant. And, and even more importantly, how many of us have those nice heavy clay soils that we have to dig in when we get back to the house? Most of us do. This tree is actually uh, resistant to phytophthora root rot. So our, our number one root rot that works against many of us in our vegetable gardens and our landscape plantings, this root stock is also going to be resistant to that particular disease. So that's why um, I've, had, I've chosen it as our, our tree of choice today. You may also choose if you would like to graft to an M7. That's another small tree, um, going to be dwarf in size, that either one, um, are going to be roughly 40% to 50% of an original tree's big height. So it should tell you right off the bat, it's a medium to small yard tree. It will fit under our utility plantings, underneath a, a utility wire or phone line, anything like that. So um, it's a nice sized yard tree that one day, maybe about five years from now, you should be able to go around and pick at chest height and not have to be climbing all the way up in the top to enjoy apples. <clears throat> the grafting uh, technique that I have um, that we're going to demonstrate with today is actually called uh, the Omega Cut or the Omega Cut Graft. And basically, we're going to be taking a piece of rootstock, we're going to be taking a piece of scion wood, the desired variety that we want to put on top, and we're going to be making cuts on both that lower and upper portion and then placing and pushing those two pieces together and, and helping them um, and wrapping the wound. Um, back in the day, it was not uncommon. We did everything with a grafting knife, a single-sided flat knife that um, a good orchardist and someone that had grafted and had years of experience 
would sit and they would try to make a nice 60 degree cut on the on the either side of the wood that they're working with something you know nice and sharp and tall and then we would actually cut a tongue or cut back towards ourselves and this was you know this is a little more difficult for this group and one of the reasons why um, it's nice now that we have the pliers available uh, we don't oftentimes have to worry about anybody cutting wrists and hands and fingers off. The neat thing back in the day, this was called a whip and tongue graft. By making those two cuts and cutting a tongue into my piece of material, I could then slide the two inner tongues together, just like that, matching up the green cambium layer that is, under, that is just underneath the bark. That's your living you know, portion of the tree that we must make sure contacts each piece. And once that was all contact, uh, you know, pushed back together with our two separate pieces, we would use garden jute, rubber bands, um, uh, twine, whatever it might be, to try to um, wrap this area as tightly as we could back together. And um, then we would take beeswax, for instance, and we would wax over the entire wound and once that wound was um, fully waxed up and sealed up, we would go and uh, place the trees aside so that we could, they can start to go through their healing process. Um, the problem with this uh, whip and tongue method right there is there's a lot of jagged edge, there's a lot of air space. Uh, the connectivity of pushing those two pieces of cambium together is very questionable whether or not they're making good contact. Luckily for us today, we're going to get to use the new grafting pliers that are available uh, online and in, in, in some stores now. It's becoming much, much more popular. But instead of having this, let me go ahead and cut this off and let you all can pass it around. Uh, y'all can just look at it. Instead of having that whip and tongue type graft union right there, our new pliers, if, we're going to use, if we use them correctly and are able to line everything up nice and tight and straight, they will actually generate, when we push through with our pliers or cut through with our pliers, a wonderful omega or puzzle piece cut. And the neat thing about this is if we're, if we're very similar in our rootstock diameter and our scion wood that we're going to put on top, when we put those two pieces back together, they, and slide them in. We don't push them down from the top. We slide them in like a puzzle piece. If you would, pass that around and check out how tight and nice that particular graft union is right there. Instead of having some jagged triangular edges and we're trying to meet up interior pieces, now we have a full omega contact on two sides as long as we've managed to match our diameters. We have a full section that is putting green to green. It's providing for the fastest um, callus and healing of that particular area of anything else we can do. So these graft, grafting pliers have even extended my success at grafting exponentially. In fact, I'm usually about 65% successful when I'm doing a standard whip and tongue with the knife like I demonstrated. But when I use grafting pliers, I'm 99% successful with my initial grafting. Now, there's going to require some care when we're done to make sure we're successful. Um, our practice in putting things together today can be the easy part. Um, it's going to be, today's exercise is going to be one of patience as well because when you get ready to take your young trees home that you've grafted together, then becomes the critical care unit there at the house to make sure we can provide some ideal habitat for these trees to heal in and then be moved out into the outdoors. Um, just want to mention that uh, this particular grafting tool, um, there's a wide, they've, they've got many generic versions and stuff on the internet now or on, uh, on Amazon and other area, on other websites. But when I first purchased my set nearly 17 or 18 years ago, it was different from this and fairly industrial in its size. And what I've found um, through the years is they've refined things and made things easier for us to uh, interchange the blades on and have replaceable parts with. And even this set here that was $45 a few years ago 
can now be found on these um, on the websites for twenty six twenty nine dollars a pair. They come with wonderful, and it probably comes it probably comes with its own case, its screwdriver, and an extra set of blades. Yeah. So it's wonderful for us that you know if we've learned this technique. Instead of being able to have to go out there and purchase an apple tree or purchase a replacement tree for the yard, if I want to be a little industrious, uh, instead of paying $16 or $25 for that apple tree with some rootstock and my desired scion wood, I might be able to graft you know, five and six trees for the single cost of one. Yes? That's, that's the difficult part for homeowners is rootstock. Um, they, uh, the companies prefer to sell to you know, large growers or in, in volume. Doesn't mean that you can't sm find smaller volumes in the, in the range of 50 trees and maybe a couple could go together and, and, and make a smaller purchase or a smaller volume purchase. I'm purchasing about 800 trees minimum myself for the grafting workshops that we do and the demonstrations we do at the school as well. And, um, that is part of usually a larger order where we're ordering about 4,500 to 5,000 trees a year for extension programming so we can do this, these demonstrations. So next year if I want to grab a tree, I can come by some? Yes, you could. <laughs> if, in fact, I'd extend that to anyone that is uh, interested in stuff. If, they, if you let us know in advance or let myself know in advance, I'd be more than happy to add to my order when placed because that's another important thing. We place these orders for these young trees in September, um, usually no later than October, for the spring of the year. So um, most homeowners are eager to uh, dive into something or go, where can I get my rootstock? I need it today. I'm going to start grafting. That's not the case. This is, a, this is a well thought out process of ordering your trees nearly eight months earlier, uh, collecting your scion wood in February during your pruning, normal pruning processes. And then grafting in that March-April time frame when, it's, uh, when it allows us to put those two pieces of wood together and have those buds ready to break and take off. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the technique before we get too far along. I'm going to peel this. I'm going to peel some of the bark away just so y'all can see very clearly. The... Um, See that green layer just underneath the bark? That is the critical layer that we need to make sure contacts the, the base green layer and whatever we've made our cut in. The neat thing about um, these pruners is that they, you know, they're fairly sharp and they do a wonderful job of making that omega cut. But they don't do anything when it comes to trying to match up the diameter of our, our two pieces of wood. And that's the critical part. Um, if we were to pull out, let's grab one more tree here. If we're looking at this piece of rootstock here, we have to think about a couple things before we go cutting just willy-nilly up and down the stem. Ideally, we want to place these rootstock when we get them home this evening or by the latest tomorrow. We want to get them potted up or planted up in some type of uh, container. I, perp you know, I, I usually use a regular cardboard box filled with the composted sawdust or other organic material from the compost bin and some garden soil. It does not need to be potting soil. It does not need to be expensive soil that you've purchased. Just some good amended topsoil will go a long way to growing healthy apple trees. But the important thing to think about is when I place this tree, this young tree, in that pot tonight, I'd actually, I want to extend it almost down to the bottom of the pot because all up and down the stem, just underneath that bark layer, are advantageous shoots and, or root areas that are going to root. Much like a tomato plant when it's planted deeply in the soil, it will encourage. In fact, if you can see the little white nodules and stuff right there, just where it's been kept moist for the past um, 25, 20 days that I've had this tree, it's already wanting to additionally root out. And so if we could place our rootstock roughly, you know, two to four inches deeper in that pot, in addition to the roots that are there growing out, your new roots are going to start to form and grow out in the pot as well. Up to your yeah, up to my hand. Yeah, 
up to my hand. I'm not going to trim these roots or the hair. They're there. I'm going to try to space them out in my pot and cover them lightly and move up within the soil within the pot. Now, if we pretend that my hand is ground level, now here's the critical part as to deciding where we make our cut for our graft union. And that is because I don't ever want a graft union to be so close in proximity to the ground that it ever gets covered in mulch or soil. And the reason being is that top scion wood that you've graft, took care to graft onto, um, if in fact it gets covered with soil or mulch, what will happen is it will start to root there. And what you'll have is you'll lose your rootstock. It'll just rot away out from underneath the tree. And your scion wood, or your desired variety, suddenly has none of the advantages of a rootstock at all. And it can grow right on the back up to a 40 foot tall apple tree like what you remember as a child. But, so if my hand is the soil base there in our pot, and I've provided this much room to really be planted nice and good and deep, I look for four to six inches an area four to six inches higher somewhere in here to create my cut for my graft union. And by placing it up there, I'm pretty much assured that I never will end up in a situation where soil or mulch is piling, is piling so high. And if it is, it shouldn't be. If you ever pile mulch up that high on a, any of our fruit trees, you're creating an unde undesirable habitat for meadow voles and field mice. And some of us know exactly how destructive those little guys can be. Um, they will eat and girdle every bit of bark right off your tree. So um, in many cases, when they're planted out in their final location in the landscape, I have made many suggestions to uh, people that have gotten back in touch with me now and said, hey, the, the gravel technique is, seems to work very well. We are actually, instead of mulching the trees at all, we are putting a nice gravel base in and around the base of our fruit trees so that that area is inhospitable for uh, making a house out of or tunneling through or it's just not their desired area to be in as well as usually that gravel affords a nice difference in color so our hawks and owls and other things that will uh, help take care of our rodent problem can see them if they're feeding on our trees and it helps us out in the long run. The gravel, I'm, I'm talking normal, uh, like 57's clean stone, gri normal, uh, normal driveway stone. You, oh, uh, just a couple inches in, di uh, in depth. And you can have your gravel base as far out uh, beneath your tree as what you desire to mow around. Um, I would suggest at least you know, 12 to 24 inches would be an excellent width you know, of gravel around the base of the tree to really help you it keeps weeds down, water still easily makes it down through and accesses the root system, but it just makes an inhospitable environment for the rodents that are going to be working on things. So once again, if we envision the hand and we've gone four to six inches up, this is the diameter of, of root stock that I have got to match in diameter of our scion wood outside. Yes? My only concern is, if they make it underneath your milk jug or do anything to get inside the milk jug, um, they're, 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 they're protected at that point. So I should go and take that off and scrape out the um, I would just, I would probably do away with the milk jug and stick with the, um, stick with the gravel base and open. The other thing you're creating is a kind of a mini greenhouse effect and where that bark there on the base of your trees is probably warming prematurely. And your sap flow and stuff, particularly this time of year, we're, we're still getting those 25, 26 degree mornings and stuff from time to time. If you've already warmed your tree and sap flow is beginning, has begun traveling up, and then we get back into a freeze situation, uh, you can sometimes, uh, that sap flow itself, once frozen in the stem, will, will bust open your trunk. It's called southwest injury, because typically it's on the southwestern exposure, the warm side, when trees don't have the milk jug, just simply the tree itself, that incurs that injury. So um, it's something just to, just to think about. Um, I know you're wonderfully, you know, you're thinking for the health of my tree, this is ideally what I'd like to do. 
But the other thing is, how do you control for the insects and stuff that get in underneath there? Suddenly the birds can't reach them. <laughs> Just a suggestion. But um, so back to our rootstock. Um, everyone here is going to take three home, tr three trees home today, um, uh, of whichever one you choose. I'm not going to. Uh, say that you have to take one or the other, I would highly encourage you to take or consider this one here based on its disease package. I think it's going to be a wonderfully, uh, uh, a good small tree for your lawn and landscape that's going to offer you apples actually fairly quickly. The last thing I failed to mention about rootstock is, um, and particularly one like this here, is a term called precocity. And precocity is how soon those apples um, mature to the point where they are of bearing age and start bearing actual fruit. And in this particular case here, this is a fairly young, vigorous rootstock that reaches maturity in as little as four, to, you know, four years. So actually, once you've grafted and we have our top scion wood on our base and it grows out the first year, that's year one. Year two and then year three, if you see flower blossoms on that tree, I would encourage you to pull them off. We want as much energy to go back to the root system. I really want to build the base of the tree before I try to support the top of a tree. But by year three, your tree is going to be flowering with a potential for um, fruit set. So we have to be care you know, uh, make sure that we pull off that initial fruit set or any flowers that may occur that year three. Year four, you have at it. Enjoy your first apple or so off the tree if it is set by that time. In many cases, if you were to plant just a standard tree, we would be looking at year six or year seven before we might actually see our apples start to bear on the tree. So, um, I will mention one last thing with regards to our scion wood. If you're going to collect this yourself, we know that we do it in February, but we need to know where to look within the tree. And it's basically the last season's growth and only the last season's growth. If we cut um, wood that is older than two years of age, we are actually back into the apple and, and also pear, back into that level of wood, it's where actual fruiting wood is going to start growing and occurring. Uh, your fruit is born on spurs, and those buds have actually physiologically changed over to fruiting buds. They're no longer nice, tight, triangular buds laying flat on the stem that are vegetative. They're getting ready to produce fruit. We don't want fruiting buds as grafting material. And oftentimes, the grafts don't work well if they, if they are a fruiting bud. They'll, they'll die and we'll lose our graft. So we want the most recent season's growth. How do you tell? It, it's literally, take this back here. On a tree that has uh, had, uh, had decent nutrition, and when I say decent, minimal nutrition, you should be getting uh, new branches on that tree that are 12 to 18 inches long. Um, trees that are in, uh, have gotten older and have re reached their maturity as far as age, it's very hard to find good scion wood because they're just trying to reproduce themselves. All their wood has basically gotten down into the actual apple, uh, apple spurs and the apple wood to re try to reproduce itself. Um, what we're looking for is nice, flat, you know, pencil-sized shoots. The water sprouts, all those sprouts are going straight up just off the trunk of the tree that were pruned off the pre previous season and shot up again the next year. Those are wonderful scion pieces. Because I'm looking at like 60-year-old trees. Yes. And if you're looking at a 60-year-old tree and can't find this type of material, Find an area where you can make a blunt cut on a relatively large limb and you'll get five or six of these grow off right there where you've made that relatively harsh cut, but at the same time you've generated lots of new wood in which to graft with. We, we are approaching where most of the trees in the area, their bud swell has already started to occur. It doesn't necessarily mean though that you couldn't find a, if you found a piece of scion wood and its buds still look tight and against the, the, against the stem itself, um, it would be perfectly good uh, to collect some scion wood off that tree that fell this past winter in an ice storm and actually graft that tree. So we could, we could perpetuate that, that variety. Okay. Yes, I like, 
I like this. Oh, well, here's your example. Here's a, here's a piece of sinewood collected this morning. And it's, it's no bud swell yet. And there is every two buds are a new tree. So instead of having, you know, I think, you know, oh, is this, a, is this a tree? No, this is one, two, three, four, five, you know, roughly five trees that he has the ability to work with, um, um, placing them on new rootstock. So um, like I mentioned before, our whole purpose is to use these pliers and put together two nice pieces. But let's talk a little bit, now that our pieces are together, like they are right there, Let's talk about what we do next. Yes, ma'am. So, yes, it's usually always better to have the root stock to be your larger side. Your larger side. And here's the neat thing about grafting. Those two pieces do not have to be the same diameter. Um, you will be very successful and just as successful if your root stock is larger and you line up your scion wood to one side. Remember the green on one side it's got to contact the green on the other on that same side. So you don't you don't try to line them up dead in the middle where the green misses all together. Slide your piece your second piece of scion over to one edge, and then we'll we'll tape and wrap at that point. And that green conductivity there will heal over and callus over, knit together, and your new tree will take off just as easily. Actually, the callus, you, in a few years, you won't even recognize that it was ever uh, anything there other than a, your graft union itself. It will all callus and form over. Since it's wrapped, so it's like you don't have to worry about what it's doing. That's correct. Well, that's, that's our next part. We're going to talk about a little bit about the wrapping. Um, I'll grab my own tape up here. The, uh, what I've found is it's much easier than trying to wrap with uh, uh, string or yarn or anything like that, I found it's much easier to use cheap electrical tape. Not necessarily good sticky 3M or something like that industrial wise. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that's mildly, you know, still sticky and stuff. And if I feel that it's too, got too much adhesive on it, I'll stick it to the table, pull it up, get a little dust on it, and I'm ready to go. Um, what I need to do though is pay attention Here's my graft union on this tree. Everything below is rootstock and undesirable with regard to its bud growth. So thumbs, not made for telephones and stuff like the kids think. They were actually made for scraping off buds. And we scrape off every, and you have to kind of rotate your, your rootstock around as you're going down because your, your apples are bu um, born on alternative sides, uh, or your buds are. And as you progress down the stem, you're just going to rub off with your thumb those little triangular buds. That does not mean to get in here and grab and pinch and tear down. We don't want that. Although, see that green area right there? You really haven't damaged the cambium. You've just exposed it. So you really haven't hurt anything, but that's an unnecessary wound for the tree to have to deal with as far as the stress. So like I said, just continue down each bud and just gently damage or rub off the bud with a thumbnail and you'll be good to go. Once all your buds have been removed, right here once again was my graft union. Pay attention because this will help you a lot. If you hold your rootstock in your, in your uh, non-dominant hand, because I usually have to have my good hand in which to wrap with, I start my tape a full inch below, a full inch below my graft union. And I will actually turn my rootstock in that hand one full revolution to where my tape is actually contacting itself. Can everyone see that? At that point, once I know the tape will stick to itself, I turn my tape up at about a 45 degree angle and I gent gently begin to roll my rootstock. As I roll that, as I roll my plant base all the way up and over my graft union, I stop about a quarter inch above the bud that's up on top. And once I've got taped up to there, we're going to go outside. That's the next spot. We'll all stand up here in a minute and go out and visit that area. But we're going to take some grafting wax. We're going to, graft the, we're going to wax the bottom of our tape, top of our tape, and right up on the very top, that green cut that we made when we cut it from our other piece, our larger piece, we need a little grafting wax up there as well. Once we have it all waxed up, 
and we have it all sealed and put together, our tree is finished, except for you absolutely need to gra grab, I'll pass out the Sharpies as well, grab some flagging tape or some other, you know, anything that we have here that we've provided, and write down, <laughs> write down, write down the variety that you have used so that you will not forget this when you've put it in your bag to take home. Outside, um, uh, we have some newsprint, some newspaper. Just get you a single piece of newsprint, wrap it subway style around your root system and stuff here. We have some uh, rubber bands out there, band it up. Um, we're going to spray it a little bit of water in the water with the water hose to get it damp and put it in one of the plastic tr uh, grocery bags that we have out there. Do one tree at a time. I promise you if you carry three trees to your spot on the table, you're going to get confused as to where you're at and what, what, what you've grafted and what you have it. Work on one tree at a time, get it in your bag prepared to go home and have it labeled and you'll be so much better off. Okay. Um, if we may, can we step outside and we'll talk about the rest of this process out there. We'll show you briefly. The, the tape she mentioned is uh, when you might take it off. It's kind of nice in that if we haven't waxed the whole thing, this tape tends to start peeling by about August or uh, at least July and August, somewhere in there. Um, by fall, by the time when we're prepared to actually set the young trees out in the landscape in their permanent location, if your tape has not started to peel or peel off, gently just back your tape off and remove it and you'll see that your nice calloused uh, graft union is going to be just below. Don't be alarmed if your tape has stuck and you used expensive 3M and it peels the outer layer of bark. As long as you can still see that green cambium surface, it will eventually callous and be just fine. You haven't killed anything. So let's step outside and take a look at what we have out here. Okay. All, all the wood, all the branches that you see here um, were collected from orchards uh, right here um, in we, either in Floyd County or neighboring counties adjacent to us. There's not a single apple here that I don't think can't easily be grown in Floyd County. Um, I will be the first one to say uh, my favorite variety is not everyone's favorite variety. Um, if you have a specific apple that you've grown accustomed to for its flavor and taste, or you have that specific cut, um, cooking apple that you've come to enjoy that makes the best applesauce, you know, stick to it and, and choose to enjoy it. But um, I would encourage everyone, anyone here to try a variety or so, since you're taking home three trees, try something that you maybe haven't tried before um, as a possibility. But let's begin over here. I want to go briefly through all the different varieties. Um, this first, this, I need you to, to ignore the first word on this very first sheet. It says that this is a Newtown Pippin. And in this case, this, this wood that I have below is not a Newtown Pippin at all. It's our Albemarle Pippin. This particular wood was collected from Jamison's Orchard down in Roanoke. And the Centennial Orchard, been in, their, their farm has been recognized by the governor in the state of Virginia as a, a, a farm that's been in, the, um, been in the family for over 100 years. In fact, the Albemarle Pippin that we have here and it it's really is described uh, very similar to the Newtown Pippin here. That particular tree was once um, uh, all the apples were harvested, put into wooden um, uh, barrels, uh, usually stacked them about two, barrel, uh, two apple uh, levels high and really forced down the top of the barrel, placed on ships, and sent back to England and to the Queen. So this apple right here has a lot of history. Also, the Pippin in general in our area has a lot of history as being one of our best keeping apples, providing longevity in, on into even the spring of the year as far as keeping that apple and having it for carryover um, for cooking and, and eating purposes um, back when we used to not have the refrigeration and things that we have today. Um, moving right, right along, the Arkansas Black is, uh, is an apple that um, many use, whether it be in cider production, 
It's a very tart apple, a beautifully dark, dark red, almost black appearance on its uh, finished coat. Um, but an old one, an old apple that's been around for a number of years. The Aztec Fuji here, um, that's one of our latest season um, apples that I have amongst all the varieties here. And that, and that particular apple comes in in October. Um, we have another Fuji that actually, uh, another variety of Fuji that comes in much earlier. But most of these apples here, except for an exception when I get further down the line, are going to be ripening in late September for many of us in Floyd County. Um, so the Aztec Fuji is one that's going to offer just a little longer extension um, into the uh, end of the fall of the year before we harvest. And it too has an excellent shelf life, but all, you know, much sweet, you know, it has a sweet um, dessert flavor as well. So it can be done for apple, uh, for cooking and or fresh eating. And like I said, it has that same long shelf life. Cortland, if I had to ask you how many of you are familiar with a Cortland, you probably wouldn't raise your hand. But if I said Macintosh, how many people have heard of Macintosh? Okay. The Macintosh is actually a parent of Cortland. Cortland is the new and approved, or supposedly improved, variety of Macintosh. Um, in fact, once this apple is mature, you'll see that on a Cortland it will have a same green uh, shoulder or window pane on those apples as its parent Macintosh variety. Wonderful, good um, uh, eating fresh apple as well as well as a cooking apple can go both directions. The um, the Gala apple that we have right here, this is Royal Gala. Once again, this one was taken from Jamison's Orchard at the base of the mountain. However. This is a very popular apple that you find in just about every grocery store that you go to. Lots of folks call them the lunchbox apple. They're not necessarily big, uh, you know, excessively large apples, but they're just the size perfect for a student in their lunchbox. Moving along, I placed these two varieties up on the air conditioning unit so that you'll have a chance to pay attention if you're, as you're making your selection. This is um, actually Blushing Golden. It's a Golden Delicious variety right here. And this beside it is the Gibson Golden. And both of those two varieties, either one of those varieties, because of their Golden lineage or Golden Delicious parentage, um, are considered, univer considered universal pollinators. Those particular apples right there can pollinate thousands of other apple varieties. There's some apples, like the wine sap down on the end, it won't pollinate any, you know, it doesn't pollinate anything else here. But um, for the most part, one of those apples can pollinate every apple tree in about a two mile radius um, from that tree if we have good bees and bee activity. So something to think about if you like a yellow delicious or if you dislike a yellow delicious because you think it gets punky too early or too soft too quickly. Um, these are improved varieties that offer a, firm, a, a firmer flesh and a slightly longer uh, keeping ability, but it's a dessert apple, either one of those apples there. Moving on, we have Granny Smith down here on the ground, my sister's favorite, uh, but she, I, you know, I won't say anything more about my youngest sister, but <laughs> she loves a green tart apple and right there it is. I have no place for this apple except in a pie that has had lots of sugar added. So from a cooking perspective, absolutely a wonderful apple. And for those of us who enjoy a super tart apple, you know, firm flesh, you, it's more have at it. Okay. Um, moving along, this is our one exception to the rule of all the apples here. I mentioned um, as far as when they ripen or when they're preparing to ripen, and the Lodi is our earliest ripening apple here. Um, two things to think about. In Floyd County, we usually have early transparent, also a yellow green apple, and the Lodi tend to ripen as early as that July, uh, the July time frame in, in some cases. And because they ripen early, usually indicates that they also flower earlier than the rest of the varieties up here. And that could set us up for a late spring frost or freeze. So it's one that you might be cautious about as far as locating your new trees. Don't plant them in a low-lying area where frost and freeze will pocket 
and uh, not be able to move off the site, we need to plant them up on a hillside slightly so all that cold air will drain away from wherever you've planted your trees. Um, once again, early, you know, the earliest of the apples available and my choice is up here. Um, won't say much about a delicious. Many of us think, you know, some of us will say, oh, we don't like a red delicious. You know why you don't like a red delicious? You haven't tried our homegrown red delicious. Um, Southwest Virginia, Floyd County with our elevation, we offer some of the best tasting, you know, uh, highest sugar content red delicious apples around. So yes, if you're, if you're purchasing your apple um, and it's being shipped in from, you know, far away places, um, the Red Delicious has lost uh, some of its flavor and enjoyment. Uh, it may have a beautiful color and the exact teacher's desk, you know, desk apple shape, but um, I promise you our, our local Red Delicious will win on flavor any day of the week. Um, the, uh, just an enjoyable all around, I think just a good off the tree eating apple. It's nothing to look at. It's not very pretty. But as far as just an enjoyable, good flavored apple off the tree, um, just something to consider. Um, moving along, we have the Summer Rambo, another uh, really uh, uh, conventional or um, uh, big industry apple right now, the Summer Rambo. Um, and just like its name implies, it's, it's going to be coming in usually in that August time frame for us up here on the mountain. Um, but can go either way for fresh eating and or um, cooking, uh, cooking purposes. We'll move on to the wine sap. That's my favorite apple. Back in the day, it was the apple tree that was located by my school bus stop. So when the neighbor would call my father and say, get John out of my apple tree, um, <laughs> I'd been climbing up to collect the wine sap or two before we headed off to school, or I beat him to the apple on my way home from school. So. Um, just another wonderful old variety that's been around for years and years. It needs a pollinator such as Golden Delicious, but in Floyd County we have lots of pollinators around getting the job done. The last one that I have over here, the last two, the first one is Freedom. And um, once again, it's another apple that serves a dual purpose, whether you want um, an apple that can provide cooking uses and or fresh eating. Um, it's a late season apple, so it will be at the very end of September usually as far as when it matures. And the, um, this particular apple is usually very successful in my grafting classes. If people try it, it's one of those that have come back repeatedly. Oh, that graft took for me and did well. And I think it largely has to do with the, the nice, big, healthy buds that that apple tree tends to have. The last one right here is from my dear friend Connie Lawson. Um, she owns an orchard over here in Fairlawn, just in Pulas just outside Pulaski, or inside Pulaski County, um, past Radford. And that Lawson apple right there is a variety apple that uh, was born on one of her trees in her orchard that was obviously different in taste and appearance from every other apple on the tree. So they took a vegetative cutting and started um, growing that, uh, the Lawson apple out and it was just such a wonderful tasting, enjoyable apple. She's, uh, they, her and her late husband had named it the Lawson apple. So um, I want to say thank you to Connie. Every, uh, every one of these pieces of scion wood that has a sock and a rubber band on the bottom of it are actually out of her apple orchard. Um, and uh, she is still, uh, she works at Virginia Tech, comes home and takes care of an entire a uh, good size orchard of trees. So um, my hat's off with respect to Miss Connie Lawson and her contributing every year. Us all set up here trying to make um, trying to make a sticky process a lot less sticky and messy inside. So I've brought this particular area, you know, set up this area outside. What I'd like you to do is I have two bags of rubber bands. But when you get out to this point, um, like I said we need to wax the top and bottom of the tape and up on very top. I've got some paint brushes here. I've got some grafting wax down in the base of my crock pot and just a little dab on two sides is usually all that's needed. If you, if you can see that and it, it rotate it all the way around, I can do it again right here at the base of my tape and right up on top. 
I now have a prepared tree ready to go home. I've got to make sure that I keep its root system nice and moist when I get there. So, a piece of newsprint, and I'm going to have to find a rock I can see already to keep things nice. But if you will take your apple tree, fold up its roots just gently within the root newsprint, uh, fold it over like a Subway sandwich, and roll. Get you a rubber band, put your rubber band around it. I will by that time have filled up a white cooler with water over here because someone undoubtedly is going to spray someone else with the hose because that's a dangerous position to be in. So I will make sure that all we have to do is, is, dip the, um, is to dip our apple in the cooler and you'll be set to go. It doesn't have to be super saturated. It doesn't have to be slopping wet, but something moist enough to keep those roots moist when you get home. We got tied to Bessie's tail over here is a, uh, the plastic bags. Put your trees in a plastic bag once they're labeled and we're good to go.